Amazing. I'm super excited about this, Ben. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Mode podcast. I'm super excited because Ben and I have been speaking about launching this for at least three years now, and the day has finally come. So we appreciate you tuning in. We're very grateful for your time, and we're excited to share what's going to be a host of topics around technology, cybersecurity, and all things life in general. So let's go. Gave him Ben a back. <laughs> Love it. This is awesome. This is great to be doing this with you, Ben. So appreciate you just as much. Oh, appreciative of everything we have achieved and what we're going to achieve in the future. And you know what? On your sentiment, thank you for everybody for joining because as I said to Gabe about 10 minutes ago, time is the only valued resource in life. So your time is valued and we appreciate it. It's awesome. There's a lot of good energy coming out from a lot of our close friends, family, and even the industry about this. So we will have a lot of hosts and guests come on and join us for various topics. But today we'd actually like to rabbit hole our own stories, what we've been doing together in the last few years, and particularly for me, what we both find interesting about cybersecurity. And I think there's going to be a lot there that we'll just get into deep conversation around, Ben. So where would you like to start? You know what? So many people have asked about this over the last you know three years since we've known each other. So why don't we start with, why don't we start with how we got to know each other and why we formed the bond that we have today? I reckon that's a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. It gives an insight into our relationship too, which yeah. would be a key theme moving forward. But we have been working together over the last three years when we really built the business at Next Gen Group around cybersecurity. That was where I met you. We both have a very common background coming from the army. Yours is a bit cooler than mine or vice versa. Who knows? I'll leave that to the audience. What we built at NextGen was amazing because we really had an opportunity to craft it as our own. We're under really good leadership. We had a lot of autonomy and we were in the ultimate vantage point in the industry. So it was really exciting to really hit the ground running there and learn a lot about the industry, but craft what we ended up building. Yeah, I think that's, I think, and if we can just, and I love it when people say double click on, but let's, let's go back and talk <laughs> about the, the heritage because I think that's fundamentally why we've been able to come into the industry and put a different lens on. And I absolutely think that's why you and I have, we hit the ground running from day one. So from a heritage perspective, let's talk through your military career and, and just a, a helicopter view on what your military career was to you and why it was important to where you are today. That's classic, Ben, just throws the baton over to me. But I would actually like to hear your story first, Ben. Why don't you tell the audience about you? So this is the most nervous I'll get in an episode. I guarantee it. For the rest <laughs> of the dark mode seasons, this will be the most nervous I get because talking about myself is the hardest topic. All right. So for me, I've had a few careers in my life and I think it's important just to go backwards prior to the military careers. Whilst I look 18, I'm actually a little bit older than that and I've had a few careers. It's a beauty before, field. It is the beauty field. Touch up my appearance and everyone knows that I do that. So... Um, <laughs> I never put a hashtag, no filter under any of my posts. So I started, uh, I left school and I uh, was playing rugby union and was doing an apprenticeship as an electrician on the side. So went through that, um, and got some, had some really great mentors along the way who taught work ethic. And, and that was really fundamental to, to my work ethic today. It was all about maximizing your time to achieve the goals that you have in life. And with that, I, I learned a lot across that journey. The global financial crisis hit a long time ago for, you know, some of the young people that are listening, you probably have to Google that and probably look up the encyclopedia in the old paper version, but that hit. And I took the opportunity to go and live overseas for two, two years, two and a bit years, uh, and lived in Germany and worked at the Hard Rock Cafe as a line chef, where it was the complete opposite to the life I was used to living. It was all night shift and it was working all hours, um, and got to experience the world and really meet and, and talk and learn from people all across the world. And that was super important to be able to be one of my strengths in life is self-assurance. And I think I grafted that in that time when I lived overseas, came back, worked for Google for a bit, doing the inner space piece, which is a subset of street view. And I did that in Queensland for a little while before I joined the military. And then I joined the military straight out of recruit school into my initial training as a signaler, as a radio operator, comms operator. You! Yeah, that's it. Just waving <laughs> the banner. And then, yeah, so I did, I did 10 years and well, just shy of 10 years in the military. Didn't quite make long service, but I went straight from IETs, which is initial entry training and or employment training from the SIGs in Melbourne. 
straight into uh, special forces and was lucky enough to stay there for nine years. Uh, so you were direct entry special forces, Ben, straight yeah, out of training. Straight out of training. It wasn't the plan. I met my wife in, in the training school there and we'd planned to go somewhere else. But when life throws you an opportunity, you got to run with it. So I was given the opportunity to go for special forces um, straight out of that. You're too good. A bit of performance punishment straight to the big leagues. Yeah, straight to the big leagues. I was able to Amazing. grow my first beard in, in the special forces when I deployed. So that was great. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's where, where I really got to uh, hone some of the, the precursor elements to, to where I am today and, and working with the best of the best in, in the military across the globe. We're working with tier one operators across the globe. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have the autonomy, which you mentioned earlier in, in that role too, where I was able to craft, create, and lead in a special forces team, focusing on electronic countermeasures. And then from there, deployed to Afghanistan, deployed to a few other places and got to see the world. Lots of, lots of travel across Australia, which I really appreciate too. It's not until I'm a little bit older where I appreciate all the travel I did around Australia. And I know you probably feel the same, that the world is a great place, but our own backyard is even cooler. But that's my military story. Uh, yeah, I spent nine years at Special Forces and then six months in the regular army where I, I, I'm a challenge-driven personality. And the challenges I was presented in regular army just didn't suit my direction in life. And so then I reached out and was uh, fortunate enough to meet Gabe Marzano at NextGen through our mutual friend, Thomas Minot. So shout out to Thomas for brokering that introduction. What a legend. He will definitely be a guest on dark mode. He absolutely will. That'll be a good, yeah. uh, that'll be a good session. Amazing work that the With You With Me crew do as well, which we'll go into later. But I would like to say, Ben, there's some good translation from military into cybersecurity, which I'm sure we'll talk about in subsequent episodes or a bit later on, but what drove you to transition out of army and, and come into the corporate sector and why the team at next gen? Oh, loaded questions. So for me, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I touched on it shortly there. It was the, uh, I'm challenge driven regular army just didn't have the challenges presented to me that drove my motivation, my curiosity. So really it was, it, it was that factor. I'd achieved everything I wanted to achieve in the military. I deployed. I'd been able to lead, I'd been able to mentor and create and grow programs that just exponentially grow from there. So coming back into the regular army, it was more exercise focused, wasn't operational. So for me, that challenge didn't present. And to be frank, I didn't know where I wanted to go from there. I knew that cybersecurity was something that, that I had trained in and was capable of. So I reached out to with you, with me through Thomas, I actually attended one of their programs 18 months earlier. Reached out to Thomas Minot and just said, Thomas, I'm ready. W what, what can I do? Uh, I was totally unsure of what my capabilities or skill set crossover was. And so I relied, you know, holistically on Thomas Minot's advice, opinion, and, and another friend and now colleague again of mine, John is, gave me the good shout that, Hey, why don't you look at sales engineer, um, in that text, yeah. but still being able to use the gift of gab. So I'm grateful that Thomas paired us up together. Yeah. Because he's a really good friend of mine as well in a similar journey, but we happened to bump heads, come together and build the business that next gen. It was an amazing journey. So forever grateful for that and lifelong friend in you now, which is even better. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So that, yeah, that, that's where I went. And then, yeah, I had the interview, Thomas set me up with, with next gen and just said, there's a really good culture there. And, and he mentioned you and that, that he thought that we would be a great partnership. So he had that foresight and, and look where we are today. But I remember that first interview with Gabe, I remember walking in, I had almost a full suit on and got into <laughs> the little breakout room in the back with, with Sally as well. And, and one of the questions you asked me was that's where I knew that I'd found the right place. So you asked me about what do I think the effect on the Israeli units had on the technology growth in cybersecurity? That was maybe the fourth question in there. That was the typical interview questions. And then that one, and I thought she knows what she's awesome. on about. And it, yeah. it's not the same level here because I'd just come from listening to a podcast about it on the way in. Uh, yep. And that was really where I went, Gabe and I have something special here and we're going to create something even special, even more special. Yeah. I love it. And that 8,200 unit out of the Israeli defense force, is it IDF? IDF, yeah. Special forces. Yeah. Just was so fascinating to me at the time. And we ended up doing a lot of work around it and looking at emerging technologies coming out of IDF and out of Israel. And there's so many amazing tech companies now born out of that IP, that military heritage as well, 
and doing amazing things in the industry. So yeah, yeah. very interesting work there. There's, there's a whole nother topic there because I think they've really, you know, shaped what is the current state of cybersecurity in blue team, red team, white team, purple team and um, beyond so just yeah. technology in general. It might not be cybersecurity. A lot of the 8,200 folks that come out don't necessarily go into cybersecurity, but they leverage their technology skill sets to create platforms that go beyond cybersecurity. So really yeah, added cool. a revolutionary change to technology as we know it today. Amazing. So that's my story. Is there anything else you want to ask me? Because I want to get into your story because your story is fucked. <laughs> I don't know about that. I have a lot of things I want to ask you, but I'll take the opportunity to give the background. So I like where you went with that, Ben, which was where the foundational formative years in life. And I like to cast my mind back as early as day zero, really. But for me, I came from a lower socioeconomic environment, single mother household. I wasn't with my family for a period of time. I ended up getting into soccer where I played competitively since I was five. And it just all unraveled from there for me. I grew up in North Queensland in a city in Townsville. Not, not sure many people know that about me because they associate either Brisbane or Sydney or whatever it is, but I've traveled all over domestically all over Australia because of the army background. But when I was 17, 18 years old, I realized I'd come to a really interesting crossroads in my life where I was, I'd played soccer competitively my whole life. I had started partying a lot, which was either going to go one way or the other. And I thought to myself, I'm either going to have to, I wanted to actually move out of Townsville. So I needed to find something, a mechanism to do that. It ended up being the defense force or the other option for me was to move to Brisbane and continue playing soccer to get into the professional league. So I ended up taking the opportunity to join the defense force, did the aptitude testing, and I wanted to be a dog handler in the RAF. So that's amazing. I'm very humanitarian. I love animals. My second or third preference was officer because I tested well for that. And I just remember having conversations with defense force recruiting, and I can see you laughing about this. For those listening on the audio, you'll have to jump over to the YouTube because we'll put the MP4 file there. But dear Barbara, Gabe, you've tested for officer. You, you should really consider going to Duntroon. And I was like, no, I want to become a dog handler because it's such an awesome career. So good. But they were like, I eventually was like, okay, no worries. I'll go to, go to Duntroon. And previous to that, because of my soccer background, I had realized oh, I could just play soccer for the army. So <laughs> I was like, you're the best of both worlds. Yeah, I'll go and train. It's be amazing. And defense seemed amazing as well with where you could go, deploy. Also for me, I realized I could develop myself further and jump into those high performance environments and just really craft my own journey really there. So that was really compelling for me. I trained for 18 months at the Royal Military Co uh, College Duntroon and I graduated into the most competitive corps at the time for our cohort of 150 people, which was engineers. So I'm very proud to be a sapper and it's funny because that, what would you say, a bit of banter between us where you're from the Signal Corps, I'm from Engineers. There's a lot of that inter-core rivalry in the Army, yet alone the inter-service rivalry between Army, Navy, Air Force. So the engineering capability for those who aren't familiar is you provide an effect on a battle space, which is either mobility, counter-mobility, sustainability, or the like. And for me, I like to simplify that and say it's either you build things or you blow things up. So it's basically the coolest place to be in the army. References, references right? <laughs> generally to blow things up for the engineers for those. <laughs> exactly. There's always jokes about bipping it, which is blow in place. If there's an obstacle on the road, just blow it up, get it out of the way. So very funny. And then I ended up being asked to go and do the dive course, which at the time, only a year previously, the general, of the defense force had made the decision to open up combat corps to females, which meant they had to show the right aptitude and credibility to be able to perform those roles, test for it, do it, and all the rest. So I was provided this amazing opportunity to go and be the first female in the Australian Defence Force to go and become an army work diver, which I subsequently did. So even cooler, I then was able to build things or blow things up just underwater. So it was an amazing career for me. And I served seven years full-time army. So I was really interested and increasingly interested by technology. I wanted to learn business. So I made the decision to get out of army and dive headfirst into a sales role at SAP, big global multinational known for ERP software, host of others end to end. 
sort of digital workplace almost now. And same thing, I reached out to Tom Moore at the time, the founder of With You With Me, got to know Thomas Minot, as you alluded to, and the whole crew there. I basically obnoxiously rolled up to their office every week and was like, what's up, everyone? <laughs> and then I was like, we need to get this girl a job so she stops bugging us. So that's how my story unfolded. But they were just amazing. Love the work they do. Went to SAP for a year and then came over to NextGen. Met John Walters, had the opportunity then to really lead the business in the cybersecurity space, which was more of a dormant portfolio at the time and really craft the vision, build the team. Ben came in as the technical director. We had a team of 15 people across A and Z over three years. We built the business from 400K to 4 mil to 40 mil over three financial years. And it's on track now to be a $100 million business. So just an amazing story there from all facets, I believe. Amazing work, amazing people, and an amazing industry to be in. So I found myself, I'm really driven by curiosity and love. They're my two core values, and particularly curiosity, which is one thing leads to another for me. I, I'm a very interpersonal learner. I love to hear other people's journeys, stories, insights, perspective, and it helps me learn about the world and where I'm interested so technology was one thing, business was another. Then I was like, wow, cybersecurity is so fascinating to me, particularly because of the adversarial nature of the attacker versus the defender, the red teaming, blue teaming comparison you made before, Ben. But then also, and I've been speaking publicly about this quite a lot in keynotes, but the psychological and human-centric element of cybersecurity, I'm just so fascinated in that. And technology for me is really an advancement to humanity. And cybersecurity is just this beautiful mid-ground that is so dynamic and is always in a constant state of flux and humans are unpredictable and there's all these things that contribute to just the nature of what cybersecurity and high tech is. So it's brought me here today. It's an amazing place to be. I'm always pumped more and more about life. I can feel myself getting excited speaking about that. But it's all part of that journey of learning more about myself and wanting to share a message to people globally now as to that whole picture. So it's a very special place to be when you've found that passion in life. And I'm also excited to be launching Dark Mode with you, Ben, and reaching a wider audience online. We've kicked off a lot more public speaking keynotes in person now and there's just a whole host of those and coming and recently joining Palo Alto Networks and the largest cybersecurity company in the world at the moment I just find myself more and more enthused about everything that I'm doing and so it's a very exciting place to be and it's a great journey to reflect on and it's nice to also be really in the moment happy with what I'm doing but have that vision long term as well so that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, that is I a sure, big I, nutshell. That's a big nutshell. I didn't mention professional soccer. I did play professional soccer for four years as well in the, in the A-League. And that was, I wanted, always wanted to be a professional soccer player from when I was five years old. So managed to find my way there, won a premiership, championship, goal of the year nominations and a few things. So there's some stuff publicly if anyone's ever interested in having a look at a few goals online. But um, something that I've actually just finished playing in the last year and just loving business and in tech so much that new it's a new it's a new day it's a new era so. you, you left out that you retired as a championship <laughs> winner as well uh, in your last season which is pretty special yeah. <laughs> right. uh, so there's about a hundred thousand views on one of those goals of the year and i think eighty thousand is me it's a fantastic <laughs> goal so everyone get on that youtube we'll put it in our youtube channel as well because it's fantastic so there's so much to dive back into there, Gabe. I, I really want to return serve with the question you asked me is what was the driving force behind you leaving military and jumping into commercialization? Yeah, I was really fascinated by technology and I had figured out that was interesting to me and I wanted to unravel that further. So being driven by curiosity, I was also felt like I had started to become stagnant and almost outgrown what defense was. And that's a personal edge you and I share by the sounds of it. So I just wanted more. I just wanted to be more progressive. I wanted to be, and I remember someone saying to me, technology is the future and we know technology is ubiquitous. So I just knew that I needed to change to follow 
and figure out where my passion lies. It's just yeah. really an internal driver for me. Yeah, I agree. And, and yeah, I, the, I share the same sentiment with why we left. I've just got to write down ubiquitous. Every time I speak with Dave, <laughs> there's a new word I've got to Google and that will be the word of the day. Ubiquitous, yeah. Ubiquitous, too many syllables. We'll send, that, send that one over to John O'Ben. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you mentioned just briefly, you've been talking a lot recently about and, and you're passionate about the, the crossover or synergy between psychology and technology. And... For people that have heard Gabe talk over the last few months in some of the keynotes she's presented, you really get to feel that passion that Gabe has about that crossover and that synergy. I've got a question for you, Gabe, and this is, you don't know about this question yet, but it's something that, <laughs> um, that I've been thinking of now, and, and, and I'm interested to hear your take on it because it flows from where you finished off the psychology versus the psychosocial element of cybersecurity to bring it into the cybersecurity trend or trend the cybersecurity realm or domain. What's your take on psychology of technology versus the psychosocial impact of technology in today's you is the question that, that I have. This is great. Yeah. This is classic Ben again. He just, oh, what's the rabbit hole? Just, this is awesome. Yeah. It's a great question, Ben. Kudos. I love this. I love that whole framing there and what you've presented because psychology for me speaks to the micro and the individual level, which everyone's whole world is formed out of. And then the psychosocial, to me, talks to the macro level and all those elements where you're interpersonal with people or there's a social like outlook to things. So it's with everything in life, not even just cybersecurity, but there's always the fine balance, and you said it before, or the synergy, or that intersection between micro and macro. And so that is what underpins the whole cybersecurity landscape or technology. And I feel like I've really given you something there because I can yeah. see you smiling again. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it's also another thing I believe in, which is not to look at things in isolation. We've got to start looking at the generalists or looking at how things work together or that holistic picture. So psychology is one element and to simplify the keynotes, I talk about that, but there's so many other elements that go into it, psychosocial or whatever it is, macroeconomic, geopolitical. There's so many, we can throw out a few more high eight syllable words there. There's so many things that come together and underpin what cybersecurity is. I'm glad you didn't throw any more eight syllable words out because my notepad's <laughs> running thin. And the, it, we'll put a link into uh, both the show notes and the YouTube channel on on how we can how you can reach out to Gabe for those keynotes. Something I've become passionate about in the last few months is that psychosocial element, and and that's why I bring it up. And no. I'll be running some talks in the next coming weeks, months, and future on the psychosocial impact developed from cybersecurity, and specifically on the the after effects of an attack and how the psychosocial impact really grows and is. The blast radius from an attack extends beyond just the business level element. So there's a psychosocial okay. impact on the person, the humane impact of that. And it grows beyond just those that are involved. It, 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 it affects family. It affects everyone in there. It's all the way to youth. And the reason I bring up that youth comment between this psychology versus psychosocial impact, I think it's really important because our youth have grown up with technology. They're the technology era, they're the technology generation, and they're seeing the convergence of technology rapidly and they're adopting to it very quickly, which is fantastic. But then we, what we haven't identified is the so psychosocial impact of, on our youth of that convergence and how quickly they're adopting to the technology. See, I love where this is going, Ben, because the, another thing that comes into my mind when you say so, psychosocial, and as you explain that then, which I think is super creative and I'm really looking forward to fangirling you when you give that talk, is it speaks to other things like collective consciousness. And even you look at the impact the media has, the old FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt, the negative connotations associated with cybersecurity, all of that and best. I am so particular with language and even being precious about the particular words you use in a sentence because all of that goes into the universe and it forms part of the energy and, and that collective consciousness. And I believe as you're pointing the arrow to that psychosocial element and the blast radius around attacks or compromises or whatever the case is as it relates to cybersecurity, but it's so important. It's such an important topic to speak about and bring awareness to, because we do need to start thinking about 
a more optimistic lens and more powerful energy and language and protecting the integrity of the psychosocial mindset in society. So I love it. No, I, Amazing. I, Totally agree. And it sings true to the undertones in, in what I'll talk to, but it really is, is that, uh, is the maintenance of your self-worth in a psychosocial capacity for what happens in breach, um, and breach, not just talking business, we're talking consumer based. You and I, I have my Netflix account that was breached about 24 months ago. Um, sorry to the people that did that because they had a slap back come out of, which was pretty fun. But it's that, and people don't talk about it because there is a stigma associated to the psychosocial element of cybersecurity that, uh, I, as you alluded to, needs to have that 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 broadcasted so that there is awareness around the impact of that and how we can support the human element to uh, cybersecurity incident. Yeah, we should speak about it more. What is it? The Australian Cybersecurity Centre released thirty three billion dollars in self reported losses from cybercrime in financial year 21, 22. That's self-reported. Yeah. That's something I learned from you. There'd be three or four times that amount in actuals because there's a tendency not to speak about it, hide behind it, feel embarrassed about it. And that's the psychology, that's that human element again. But well, I want to change that narrative. I want us to change that narrative. And we should because the more we can speak about it, the more we learn, the more we can improve. So, Yeah, we, we all learn through through experience. Um, not saying that we all need to experience a breach, but by hearing stories of people sharing that they have been breached, we're going to learn from what happened, what went wrong and how we can support our own digital ecosystem to prevent these types of things in the future. But until that stigma is dropped and the exposure is pronounced and broadcasted publicly, then we're never going to get to the point as, you know, here down under where we're comfortable talking about our own personal instances of cybersecurity and, and how that has affected us based on the stigma associated to it. Yeah. And let me reciprocate too, Ben, because you've shared a story about you having your Netflix hacked. Uh -huh. I actually got puppy scammed over oh, yeah. the Christmas period. <laughs> and this is a great story. It's a great story to speak to again, to share that awareness because cyber criminals don't actually need to be that sophisticated. Hacks or compromises don't usually need to be hundreds of millions of dollars into a large bank in Australia for ransomware, phishing emails or whatever the case is. It's, it could be as simple as bad mo motivators and bad actors launch a website, advertise these really adorable puppies, which I personally wanted one of. I, I wanted one too when you sent me the photo. <laughs> <laughs> Little crazy. It was very cute. He never came. <laughs> But yeah, it's like, it's happened to me, it's happened to you, it's happened to a lot of people. It's actually just the world we're living in. Yeah. And so, uh, very but, interesting. but that just goes to show how it can happen to anyone and, and how many of us have had an incident. And even the term incident perhaps should be re reworked because an incident has that negative connotation to it. It's life yeah. and it's part of the life we live. Uh, we all live in the digital world. We're about to experience more of the digital world and I'm about to open another rabbit hole, which is the metaverse. <laughs> and with that comes the, the organic growth of cybersecurity and the, the nefarious side of cybersecurity, well, of the cyber domain. So we're only increasing our footprint, which means that we're only increasing our availability for, for that negative impact on our digital ecosystem. For sure. So it's back to that old notion of we need more people, processes, technology to help harden the security posture and protect the digital way of life. But what would you offer up to the audience in terms of how we better that conversation, whether it's someone who works in the cybersecurity industry, or if I'm communicating this to my parents who are completely unbeknown to the depth of what's happening? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I only had this conversation with my parents last weekend and the amount of times they have had incidents that I only found out about last weekend was wild. And what I would offer up is, is approach the cybersecurity conversation from the personal element, be empathetic with it. There is no judgment across what has happened in the past or what is happening currently, because again, to the, to link back to that psychosocial element, it, it affects people differently and it affects them longer term or shorter term, depending how, you know, you and I are great at, at compartmentalizing things based on our military heritage. 
um, so we could potentially compartmentalize it and move on further. But for the older generation, it, it extends for a period of time um, into that ROM fraud online or, or even simple things like uh, believing that there is an Auspost that has been misdelivered and following through to, to these types of, of these types of attacks. So what I would offer up is, is uh, have the conversation with people, have the conversation with your parents, have the conversation with your family initially, because they're the zero judgment, they're the framework for your zero judgment to then broadcast externally, but be empathetic with it. Don't give them the judgment that they're waiting to receive based on the stigma that is currently out there. Approach the cybersecurity conversations from a consumer level all the way through to business with human empathy. Totally. Yeah. And what about from a cyber professional perspective? What do you think we could do to help bring this conversation to fruition? There's so much, there's so much. Fast track the requirement for passwordless authentication. That's one that, you know, passwords are the bugbear of everyone remembering passwords and the whole uh, topic in itself. Whole isn't it? topic. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we need to get our friend Chase Cunningham on for kill the password. That's uh, that's going to be a fun Love episode it. that there's, there's, there's making passwords less of a mind share problem, more of a technology problem. So yeah, I'm, I implore people to get the password management tools such as Bitwarden or, or LastPass. And relying on their algorithm to generate passwords and storing that in a password vault. That's the basic level of, of, of what you can do to mitigate the early entry points. And then there's things like I talk, I was on channel nine a few months ago, talking about how you can have secondary email setups, one for the subscriber base and one for your actual emails. The reason for that is all your subscriber base, your bills and everything go to a single source, your email account at the moment. And I guarantee, you know, I don't do it. I don't delete as many emails as I should once they've been, once they've expended my requirement for maintenance, requirement for maintenance, that didn't make sense. But, uh, I see where you're going there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but with that, as soon as anyone gets into your email, they can see everything and the ability to mind map from single email entry point is wild. You can see your phone bills, your bank statements. You can see what your interests are. So if you think and put on the red hat and, and the red hat is the nefarious side of, of the cyber domain, but once they're in, just think about the things they can mind map about you. It's not just about the, the technologies that you employ, like the Telstra's, like the Optus, like the NAB's, all of your, your personal accounts. It's what your interests are. So then they can start taking and creating a wider net across your family base, across your organization, based off the things they can understand in your email. I subscribe to Country Road because I bought a Country Road mug once. And, and from there, they know I look at my Country Road emails based on what's read and what's not read. Just Surprise, it's not like. Aaron Williams. Like, not yeah, much. it is Aaron Williams, but I don't want to give away <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's what I would throw out there as an early statement um, is to... I get things like a password management tool. Um, it sounds basic, but for those that aren't in the industry, it, it might not be as basic. It is a process to get started. I've talked to a number of CEOs across, and I, I know a few of them will be listening. Some of the CEOs have reached out on a personal level to ask about their personal cyber hygiene. And the first one is that password security management tool. And it, yeah. it is a process. It takes a bit of time to get everything across, but once you get there and, and you've already mitigated the, um, the password sharing, what you've mitigated the, the easy passwords, the breach, you've, you've mitigated, um, the passwords that have been consumed in, in data breaches from third party organizations as well. Yeah. Nice. And technology will continue to evolve too. So as soon as we've solved one challenge, a new one will arise. And this actually gets asked a lot on the keynote sign deliver. It always comes up password. But yeah. what, Alternative methods, as you mentioned, use those tools or the rise of biometrics. And then as soon as we've advanced that, lo and behold, Web3 is here, Metaverse is here. It's a whole other topic. How do we secure that environment? So yeah. it's never ending. And that's why it's so interesting to work in this field and to share these messages because the security landscape will continue to evolve, always in a state of flux. And we've got to come together, brilliant minds, and speak about these type of topics. So. Totally. And to see it back, I think the underlying tone of this episode is, has been foundations. And if we don't get the foundational elements right now, in the, the day we are in right now, recording this podcast for, you know, the next five, the next 10, the next 15 years, we're just creating bad habit. And if we don't change that muscle memory now and adopt a better foundational strategy to our cybersecurity and our digital ecosystem, then we're only setting ourselves up for failure in the future. Love it. Yeah. It's great thought leadership, Ben. We, we've gone completely <laughs> off topic, Gabe. This was supposed to be about us for this episode. So 
Yeah, it's all intertwined. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. We'll continue to rabbit hole, but it's nice to be in a state of flow as well to talk through this. Okay, I've, I've got, got a question. question. Oh, you yeah, me talk a lot then. So, and, and this is, <laughs> this is something you mentioned earlier, which was curiosity. And, and that's a driving pillar for you in life. You and I have done a few psycho evaluation testing, you know, across our military career and personally in the last couple of years. And, and I want to talk through the Gallup Strength Finder because that was really interesting to me. <laughs> we did that because there was a lot of, there was a lot of similarity between yours and, and my top five, but, but one that, you know, stands out for you and is your top. Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute though. Wait a, before you, if we did a second half of that question, yeah. do you remember your top five? I do remember my top five. Yeah. Have you written them down? I have written them down. They're right here in front. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what are they? What are they? So my top five and the Gallup Strength Finder, perhaps you just want to do a bit of context behind what it is so that people that don't know what it is have a bit of understanding first. For sure. Yeah. So it's a psychometric test that evaluates where your strengths are. A very nice tool in leadership or building teams, or even just to know about yourself personally, because I love doubling down on strengths as opposed to looking at things that aren't strength necessarily, but it's a tool psychometrically to understand more about yourself, which I love. So it's actually across four key themes, one's relationship, another's influence, executor, something like that. And there's one other, but four themes and there's 31 or 32 individual strengths, which all get listed based on how you answer the questions and what your preferences are in life and whole psychometric element to what those results yield. Amazing. And that's why I threw it to you because you can do it so much better than I can. So my top five, and, and I've done this twice and it's the same every time because I am by nature a zero trust guy and I <laughs> didn't trust my, so my, friend. my top five, number one is ideation. And that seems true to my desire and curiosity for making sure that, that things are known thought leadership and, and creating a different and putting a different lens on to, to problem statements or problem sets. Second is activator and that's just a fun one. I enjoy that. Third is strategic. Um, that's how my brain operates. I'm a strategic person, strategic thinker, strategic, and it ties in with that activator. Got to have that strategy brain prior to activation. Fourth is achiever. It's not, that's a fun one too. We can unpack that on another episode <laughs> and five is self-assurance. And I touched on that when I traveled, uh, I really grafted that when I traveled and, and got that worldly experience across the globe. I, I had the opportunity to go and live in London and there was no challenge there really. It was just like moving from Brisbane to Sydney, which just on a, on a grander scale. So I took the opportunity to move to Berlin, one, because it was the cheapest flight around Europe and two, it was a great central <laughs> hub. But thirdly, it was a chance for me to just to dive straight into a, an, an area that didn't have English as first language. And it was an opportunity for me to learn something new and have a challenge for understanding body language picking up language as quick as I can, uh, and really just immersing myself in another culture. So that's where I really grafted that self-assurance, but they're my top five. So recap, ideation, activator, strategic achiever, and self-assurance. Love yeah. it. And what are the themes there? Strategic thinking for you, influencing relationship building? Relationship building. Yeah. Yeah. And nice. Yeah. I think because in my top five, I think those three were, were the, were the, the three. Were the key themes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So mine in order are self-assurance, command, futuristic, adaptability, and activator. Yeah. So I feature really heavily in influencing, and then I have one that's strategic and one that's relationship. Yeah. There's it's a funny story. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't want to bring this back to the second half of your question, which I know you're about to yeah. ask, but a quick story for me personally, when I did this test, it was actually on my MBA course in the coaching and performance management subject about a year ago. And we needed to have done the test prior to the lecture on Saturday. I actually hadn't done the test yet, but on the, and I was soon to do it that night. But in that lecture, the lecturer was basically talking around the strengths and was saying, who's got adaptability in their top five? And here I am rocking back on my chair, putting my hand up. Yeah, I've got adaptability in my top five, but I hadn't done the test yet. And so my first strength is self-assurance. I was so self-assured that I had adaptability in my top five that I was so confidently saying, yes, that's all through me, put that, put me in that category. And then I went and did, did the test and just so funny, it happened to be there. So it's just hilarious how it all works, but pretty funny. Pretty funny. It's just, <laughs> it just, every cent you pay for the Gallup Strength Finder test was just validated in that top 
Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, we've yeah. got two. We've got two in common, particularly in our top five, which are what activator and yeah. self assurance and self assurance, and then the rest that you have that that follow into mine are within my top ten, and I think vice versa, which was really interesting as well. Uh, exactly. Be- yeah. And I just want to call those out, which is Achiever, yep. which is in your top five, sixth for me. I've got Strategic as eighth, which is in your top five, and Ideation as tenth, which is your top five. And you've got the rest in your top ten. Yep. It's, cr- it's crazy. It's yeah. <laughs> You're like um, a male, better version of me, Ben. You've got a better beard than me, so. <laughs> yeah, and I am Italian. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story, actually, that I found out early in our relationship that Marzano is a type of Italian tomato right or tomato sauce yeah san now, tomato every time i eat san pizza, tomato san tomato san tomato, <laughs> san tomato <laughs> which is a tomato based on all the authentic italian pizzas so that's going on to merch later san tomato <laughs> yeah, yeah love it <laughs> so the question for me earlier and and i don't know you caught it was um and i don't know if you'll expect this as the second half but do you think that your top five now would have been the top five from Gabe Marzano five years ago? It's a great question. And this is something that people in the team were not criticizing, but had the question marks around psychometric tests like this, because I do believe we develop as people and importantly, we become more self-aware of who we are as we go through life and we have experiences and all the rest. I believe there would be some common strengths if I had have done Strengths Finder five years ago and would have been thereabouts, but I do have an inkling that they would have been arranged slightly differently. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And with your, the stories you shared earlier on, on your, your journey to where you are today, self-assurance would have been there from some of those, you know, challenges you had in, in your younger days and you've grafted that self-assurance over your time. I didn't meet you in the military, but I know people that worked with you and alongside, and they will always say that you were the most self-confident person in the room. You just had that aura about you. So I totally agree. And that's why I bring it up. Your self-assurance has been with you for some time. And I would say that a lot of the others in your top five have been with you uh, a long time, but it, just, it, it is a matter of where they would be postured within that top five that probably potentially would be different. So if you could go back to, if you could go back to your top five, what's the one that you value the most out of that top five? That's tough. That's a great question, Ben. Yeah, it's tough. I like all of them. I can see where I would deploy them in certain situations and where they come out of me as a, as a personality. What I, I am interested in that I have self-assurance and then command as first and second, because that's just an even stronger energy than having one of those at the top, I think. (laughs) And so I learned throughout my life, I need to actually be quite conscious not to come across too direct or make sure I make people feel comfortable because being a self-assured and confident person, I know that I can make people feel uncomfortable or whatever the case is. So I make a conscious effort now to make sure I make people feel safe. There's that psychological safety around teams I'm a part of, people that I interact with. So firstly, I think having those two as one and two is really interesting. It's just to say, Rob, I think you rolled your eyes at that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I love adaptability because it's such a key thing to have in life. Things change all the time. We can all get caught up being rigorous and looking at what we've set out to do and things change. And I love that graphic of the journey of life as that linear line. It doesn't happen like that. It's a big squiggly circular mess that gets you to where you want to go. And I have started to think about goals as milestones now because I'm paying a lot of, doing a lot of work and paying a lot of attention on the journey and being the moment. I'm just like justifying all of them here. But futuristic was nice for me to see in, in my top five because I have that visionary outlook. Always considered myself to become a CEO. I'm sort of starting to question that now because of the world changing so much. And instead of being a business administrator, I want to be that visionary 
we always fangirl over what Elon Musk is doing in the world. I would like to be contributing to the conversation around where the world can go for the betterment of humanity. So I love that futuristic is in there. And activated talks, I like the top five for me are great. Activation is awesome because I want to bring people along for the journey. I want to show them where their strengths are. I want to contribute to the whole. I want to take care of my relationships. I want to reach a lot of wider community. And so all of them for me are great, but there's a few mix of themes in there that ring true. And potentially to answer your question more directly, I love the most that I have influencing theme as the core element to my top five, as opposed to one individual strength. Yeah, you know what I love you did there. You went from Scott Morrison answer all the way through to the direct <laughs> answer to the question, which was amazing. So on on track with the influencer piece, there's it's a double edged sword, and for people that have influencer in their top five, potentially it can go the opposite, and which is linking back to the psychology of technology. There is the element of influence that can can have the nefarious action against us. I know you're a conscious person. You're a conscious person, Pershon. Maybe a person too. Pershon, yeah. So <laughs> you're a conscious Pershon, and with that, how do you how do you see that strength as the double edged sword, and how do you navigate that path? Which one? Or are you talking hey, about influencing? Yeah, with influence. Can you ask the question again? Yeah. So how do you? You're a self conscious person, Pershon. See what I did there? And so with that, how do you, you navigate and how do you see that being a double-edged sword as an influence, as a key strength amongst people with the psychology element of technology? And then for me, it's thinking back to people that create SMS-based attacks, they're targeting, then they're trying to influence people to adopt an action, mm -hmm. which is to log through, submit personal details, whatever have you. So for me, people yeah. that have influence could go both ways. Are you a villain or a superhero is the real question. Love it. I love that we got there too. <laughs> totally. Influence. I love the whole realm of influence. We can speak about that for days too. Because influencing people, there's such an art to that. If you think about literature in the past around seven habits of highly effective people, there's a lot of influential topics in there, how to leverage that. If you look at even industry and salespeople, it's less about sales. It's more about influencing. How do you bring people along, even the government structures and politicians? You want to influence people. Technology influences us to think a certain way. It's actually even designed to change behavior and the way people think. So those actions are a direct result of influence. So we could go in all different directions here, but to your point, and absolutely bringing it back to cybersecurity, we all have a choice to make. I think highly influential people can either choose to use their actions for the good or the bad. And someone said to me personally, because of my psychometrics and the, my personality type, I could either go very easily down that path of destruction. Or I could go and choose the path of brilliance and use my traits for good and all the rest. But everyone has a similar outlook on life. You can choose what you do. And choice and emotion are some of the most powerful things that we have as humans. And so everything for me is a conscious choice. And I always want it to be uh, along the path of better men and that white hat hacker element. But as it in technology too and in cybersecurity, that's why we have these massive problems because ch people choose to do the wrong thing or take advantage of other people or steal things, money, IP, whatever the case. So it's very interesting. And that's why I like talking about the psychology behind tech and cyber, because it's all humans at the end of the day, using technology or the digital sphere to influence or get an outcome, cause other people to act. So. It's really important to understand that psychological element and, ha and how that does relate to technology. And I, and I believe by understanding yourself more through psychometrics, through other people's, the Johari window is another good concept where there's sort of those four, contra four quadrants and how you think of yourself, how other people perceive you and the middle grounds and everything. So for sure, uh, that's, but then there's so many unknown things in scientific fields about 
psychology and human behavior and personality. Jordan Peterson, I love listening to, he brings a lot of this to the limelight. But all of that underpins this world we live in and why I like working in cybersecurity because it's so interesting. So yeah, all of those for me. I love that you brought out Jordan Peterson because for me, it's that fine line between order and chaos. Yeah. Uh, and Jordan, Peter, Jordan Peterson talks on that really well. And from, in, you know, if we bring it to tech, Captology comes to mind and Captology sits right on that fine line between order and chaos and could swing either way. So for listeners that aren't aware, Captology is computer as persuasive technology. So it's an acronym for that. So ha have a Google because it's a super interesting rabbit hole that I'm, I'm apologetic that you're going to lose two nights of your sleep <laughs> yeah. looking at right now. But yeah. it, it, Gabe and I have rabbit holed Captology for some time. And, and for me, that is where I was going with the question in terms of superhero or villain. There's a lot of technologies in, in production now that have the capacity to, you know, have the pendulum swing towards chaos rather than order and not have that fine yeah. balance. And, and there is, you know, some interesting documentation on technology like Twitter, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook, Snapchat, all of those. And you've only got to look at the like count, which is superfluous to most of us to, to look at, but for the youth and the younger generation that was measured against their success in, in, in a psychosocial uh, engagement. Yeah, so. exactly. Well, Captology, exactly, Ben, and I'd love to go deeper into this, but fundamentally it's technology purposefully designed to change behavior and the way people think. That's going to change the minds of humans, particularly the younger generation. And so Facebook Files has been released recently out of the Wall Street Journal. Facebook was purposely designed at some point for news feeds to be generating more negative connotations and language and media. And they did this big experiment on how it would change the psyche, the psychosocial thinking around people. It's crazy. And so it's wild. It's actually wild. wild. <laughs> yeah. So there's so much to it. It's like, how do we protect that? How do we better that? How do we protect the integrity of people first? It's, yeah. Instead of a monetary gain, capitalism, yeah. all sorts of things. So much comes into it. So. Yeah. I feel like there's another episode in Captology there that we could probably talk to. That's, that's a rabbit hole that you and I have been down many times. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Have you got I, any other questions up your sleeve? No, I don't actually. And I was going to ask if you had any <laughs> red herrings for me. I think at this point we should round up the episode, but let me ask you to do that. Simple. Brace yourself. I'm bracing. <laughs> Why the name Dark Mode? Yes. Love that question. <laughs> and, and we've both got a, a similar story and I feel like you've probably got a, 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 a subset to this, but for me, why it's dark mode is it's a question I get asked in every customer conversation, does the platform <laughs> have dark mode? And whilst it may sound like a fairly materialistic question, is, is it just beautification or not? What's my take on that is. Dark mode for a platform goes to, goes to show the value that the technology and the organization places on user experience. And for me and for everyone listening, I talk about user experience all the time because it's got to be front of mind. And so if it has dark okay. mode and it's always a question that gets asked by the customers at enterprise level, not just at consumer, it's at enterprise level, the question gets asked every time. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's filtering out whether the platform or the technology has user experience front of mind, not just I love it. end user, yeah. but also admin experience as well. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Well, interestingly, you toggled your Zoom client to dark mode. So I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Had to be done. Dark mode's great. What yeah. about you, Gabe? What's, what's your why dark mode? Yeah, it's a good play on words because it's synonymous with dark security. I love using dark mode in all of my applications. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like what a cybersecurity podcast should be called. Your story is hilarious. I also really resonate with that. Even some of the interactions we've had over the past two years, Chase Cunningham, even similarly saying, if a customer's going to buy a million dollars of my tech, I'm going to build them dark mode myself. It's, it's hilarious though. It's great. I like it. And it talks to what really encapsulates a lot of areas around cyber tech and everything. So good play on words for me. It was a great concept. I can't claim that it was Gabe and I sitting around a table and Gabe just came out with this. What about dark mode? It's like, you know what? <laughs> it just works. 
<laughs> yeah. And then I was thinking, oh, should we name it Bright Mode? Because we're quite optimistic. But I was like, ah, Dark Mode's got a good story to it. It's got a good ring. So it does. <laughs> Very nice. This has been great, Ben. It's been what amazing. So we've opened about 12 Pandora's boxes. So there's 12 more episodes that people can count on. And we've got about 20 people on our list to bring into the conversation over future episodes, which I'm super excited about to get uh, other people to get their insights and how we can together influence some of the the concepts of cybersecurity, life and technology in general. Yeah. And I appreciate your time, Ben. This has been a lot of fun. Just like every conversation we have, we always end up soul searching afterward. <laughs> this will be posted on all of the podcast providers. We'll do that later today. And then also there's a YouTube for the MP4 file, which is great. And so much more to come. We'll be doing LinkedIn live streams, talking with other guests in the industry, outside the industry and everything in between. So personally, very excited and love to do this with you. So looking forward to the rest of them, Ben. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Ta.